I was just going to respond to a couple of things that uh, Dilip said. I mean, a thought has been concerned about uh, for since its formation in 2000, uh, sorry, 1994, about how we can harness uh, remittances for development to respond to the question <laughs> that was going on there. There are private flows, but we think that a lot of the problems that people are trying to solve through sending remittances can, um, there are different ways of, um, that you can convince people mm. through nudging and others to, um, to, to to basically um, have those remittances far more directed. Um, and there are two things that we work around. One is um, two principles. The first is how you can nudge people towards greater pooling for more impact. And secondly, how you can nudge people from consumption towards investment. So those are two overarching kind of principles that we've been working on. And the, um, and the uh, concept that I was talking about earlier, the remit aid, was an attempt to, to do both things, where you create um, a pool for development. People will continue sending the money that they want to achieve the individual goals that they want, but that money can attract uh, additional tax relief at the edges. I mean, the concept is very simple around uh, that we've been trying to do around remit aid. And it's, it's basically like this. With gift aid, if I were to give Oxfam 100 pounds and Oxfam built a well in my village, let's say I was lucky enough to have that relationship with Oxfam, Oxfam could attract an additional 25 pounds through gift aid for that work. If I were to send a remittance to my um, relative to build the same well, I pay tax here, and then probably Western Union or MoneyGram will take an additional 15%. So what we were basically saying is that if the outcome to a least developed country, as defined by the o OECD, meets one of the Millennium Development Goals, is it possible that that could attract um, some tax relief in the same way that gift aid does, that, essentially, that would then go into a fund that will then allow um, some of that work to go on. Um, part of that reason is that we think that remittances, uh, it was about also mitigating some of the problems that we have around remittances. If you go to Africa now and you want to find out who the new poor are in Africa, it's, you can see them go to a village. The person who has a remitter outside probably has a generator. The kids are probably in school. And the one who doesn't have a remitter who lives next door is um, considerably poorer, and you can see the difference. And so remittances, in the end, actually do create inequalities. And the new poor that I think you will find in Africa now are increasingly people without a remitter. So part of what remit, uh, remit aid is trying to do is to mitigate some of those um, uh, imperfections that you have with remittances and to create a pool that can solve some of those other problems for, for, um, for, for those who are excluded. Um, I can talk a little bit more about, about what Remit Aid is trying to do and the way to go through that. And we, we can, there's a paper on the Ford's website that you can see in a lot more detail. But I, I wanted to respond to one of the other issues that uh, Dilip mentioned, which is really about um, the post 2015 architecture and the importance of bringing in migrants and diasporas into that architecture and not just their remittances. Um, we know, as Dilip is saying, that I think by, he said by 2016, it will be at least half a trillion that migrants and diasporas around the world are sending as part of remittances. We know from World Bank figures that on average, each of those migrants impacts 4.5 peop people. So you're talking about those, uh, and they're about half a, um, half a, half a um, 400 million migrants. So they're sending half a trillion dollars, impacting 4.5 people, and you can see that that group of people are probably impacting about a billion people. We've talked about the impact that they're having on education, on, 
on uh, health, on consumption, on investment, and yet they're not part of the international development architecture. Mm. Um, the eminent uh, persons who have been looking at that framework uh, for the post-2015 agenda on behalf of Kofi, uh, sorry, uh, Ban Ki-moon have come up with a five-point program uh, framework. The fifth part of that framework is about enhanced global partnerships. And what we are, and they have listed specifically a number of people in that part, in that uh, point, that fifth point, that they see as global partners. They've listed the NGOs, they've listed obviously um, business, they've listed trade unions, they've lifted, listed a lot of people explicitly, but there's no mention of the migrants and the diasporas who are impacting a billion people. Mm. And we think and would want the support of ODI and others, for those migrants and diasporas to be explicitly mentioned in that post-2015 architecture. Because we can have these meetings where we talk about the migrants and, and what's being done to them, but until they have their own agency to be <coughs> at the table to argue about how they want their money spent, then, you know, as Chuck was saying earlier on, it will always be you know, issues about those poor Africans. So we need people, we need uh, the diasporas and the migrants at the table and uh, as part of this post-2015 mm -hmm. uh, architecture and we need uh, for, for them and to be able to talk about what they want done with their remittances, whether it means taking on Western Union and others or whether it means um, looking at different products, whether it's um, that some of them and some of the governments are now beginning to talk about and very creatively in Africa around um, diaspora bonds, different kinds of mutual uh, funds um, that can actually allow us to pull these remorse, uh, remittances for greater impact. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you. That was very, very good. Thank you.